Welcome to Resource PNG. We begin with some developments within the mining sector, with the developers of Frida River Project recently applying for a special mining lease. This application, registered with Minerals Resource Authority, now begins formal regulatory approval processes, including the all-important development forums that are required before the SML can be granted. MRA Managing Director Philip Samar announced the application by Frida River Project developers. Despite relatively low world metal prices, Papua New Guinea continues to be a destination of choice for the extractive industries. And the mining sector in PNG is once again in the spotlight with the developers of Frida River Project, Frida River Limited and Highlands Frida Limited registering their application for a special mine lease or SML. This is the first application for an SML since Ramu Nico applied for an SML in 1999 to develop the now Ramu Nico mine in Madang province. According to Mineral Resource Authority Managing Director Philip Sama, this decision by project developers once again reinforces the ability of PNG to remain a highly ranked destination of choice for mining investment. Um, for us and for the government, um, this is definitely confidence that, that, the, that PNG continues to be an investment destination and that mining particularly and of course for the LNG project that's been in the news lately, but for mining uh, with this application that's evidence of uh, confidence from the investing sector, uh, from the investment uh, point of view. The last SML application that we received, or the government received, was I think uh, Ramu's SML application, and that's what? 1999. 1999, so yeah. By registering the SML application, several activities must now take place before this SML can be granted. Among them, the all-important development forums with landowners, as well as environmental assessments. As a pre-production, capital cost of just under 4 billion US. It's a 17 year mine life, um, but it is more than 17 years. The initial period for development is 17. And as they develop the mine, then they will then uh, develop it in stages. So, but for the purposes of the submission, it's for 17 years at 4 billion US. And of course, as you appreciate, the government has to make a decision to also contribute to developing that project. Um, but what this does is it brings a major project and when you consider four billion US dollars you've already seen the changes that have been affected in Papua New Guinea from the LNG project, that, that was considerably larger, but this is going to be invested into the CPIC which has not seen a major project in its history. The Frida River project may prove to be a blessing for the country, especially given the fact that pre-production capital costs could be within the region of 3.6 billion US dollars and which could take up to four years to complete. So really the submission is now initiating the formal government approval process for permitting the Frida project and uh, the MRA will take it from here on, we will engage with the other government agencies that have a role in the permitting uh, process. Um, and, you know, our process is through a state team approach. So we have Commerce, we have uh, Treasury, we have Department of Mineral Policy and other state team that need to, um, you know, come together to, in order to see how best to move the approvals process forward. But the MRA's uh, role in that pro, uh, facilitation is to ensure that that team is there and that we uh, expedite the approvals process and to bring it to government for endorsement and finalization for the grant of the special mining lease. Once construction is complete, the Frida River project is expected to produce 175,000 tons of copper and 250,000 ounces of gold annually, making it one of the biggest producers in the country. So the lodgement of this triggers a series of, as Philip has indicated, a series of events that now occur at different levels of government, including our own regulatory processes. 
Um, timing wise, quite frankly, we, we don't have any idea at this stage as to how long there's a, a process. This is a process that takes a considerable amount of time. This is one of eight volumes that we have to, for instance, go through and review. Uh, we may involve consultants to assist us in different aspects of like the business case, some of the technical aspects of this. And at the same time, we're also dependent on um, the Conservation and Environment Protection Authority uh, also reviewing and assessing the environment permit aspect, which is obviously a critical part of the process. In terms of state participation, the state has until the grant date to determine whether it will participate in this particular project by way of equity uptake. The government has an, an uh, equity option that it needs to exercise, but that's a, that's a decision that the government will now make, given that you know, we have been officially served with uh, proposals for development. Stay tuned for more of Resource PNG. Don't go away. Welcome back. I recently sat down with Greg Anderson, Executive Director of PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, to discuss, among other things, low world metal prices and their impact on mining investments in PNG, as well as preparations towards the upcoming Mining and Petroleum Investment Conference. Welcome to Resource PNG. We're pleased to have with us the Executive Director of the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, Mr. Greg Anderson. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to come on My to Resource pleasure. PNG again. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll begin. Our prices of metals in particular have seemed to have picked up over the last few months. What news do you have for our viewers from mines right around the country? Yes, well, it's true. We've got out of the complete doldrums. We've had some recovery in certain metals, not all of them. Some of them are still dragging very much along the bottom. Uh, gold has recovered from its lows, so that's, that's been a healthy trend, although we'd still like to see it go a lot further. Small recovery in copper, but a, a, a decent recovery in oil prices, around the $50 a, a barrel mark, which is a lot lower than its historic highs, but it's a much more comfortable level. And, and, and we see that slowly rising in the future. Nothing's going to happen dramatically, I, I believe, with commodity prices. They may s slowly recover. So that, that's, that's uh, comforting news. All right. Now, copper prices rose to their highest level in about uh, seven weeks, this, just this week. Um, how soon can these price changes uh, be realised, especially with Octetti's income as our biggest? Well, it wasn't much of a rise, really. Mm -hmm. it, it might it's, it was pretty small rise, even though it was a local high. So it's, it's not something to get really excited about, but those prices translate through as copper shipments go out and, and, and they're sold. So uh, it takes some time to flow through the system because the, the, those uh, ships don't go out that frequently. Okay. But it, it will translate through. And, and uh, more importantly, I think, though, is to the whole country, and, and uh, it's a great achievement, is the recovery of Octeti and uh, that mine coming back on operation uh, completely rejigged. The whole operation has changed. It's uh, some very courageous decisions to, to bring that to back as a, as a profitable operation. So it'll take some months to recover, but we look forward to it uh, coming back as, as to contributing uh, to the government's offers in the future. Yeah. Okay. Now, before we go into discussing some of the activities you will be focusing on, for the benefit of our viewers, some of them might not know the functions of the PNG Chamber of Mines and uh, Petroleum. Are you just able to give us an overview of what the organisation is all about? Certainly. Uh, we're, we're a peak industry body, like the other chambers and so on. So our focus is the mining petroleum industry, of course. So we represent most of the players in the, in the country, those that are members. And uh, they are our, our f what we call our full members. But we also have a very large number of service companies, contractors and service players. Anybody that's involved in the industry is welcome to become a member, so we have a, a, a very large number of those. So we, our total membership is around 230, 235. So it's, it's quite a considerable cross-section of business in, in Papua New Guinea. All right. Now the Chamber has been concerned about uh, falling mineral exploration activity in the country over the past few years. Does the situation still, is it still gloomy or do you see some uh, possible increases in the, in the not too distant future? For, for the, the, the 
recovery that's happened in, say, the gold price and so on hasn't flowed through significantly into expiration. Mm. Unfortunately, the expiration scene is largely very gloomy because uh, the, the makeup of the expiration sector is what we call the, the larger players, but there are also a lot of the juniors, what we call with the smaller explorers, and they don't have any production. They just have expiration. So when the market, the financial markets dry, dry up, they can't get funding. So we've lost a lot of those, and th those that still survive are, are very much struggling. But we have a couple of very good stories in the mining side. For instance, we have two very promising uh, discoveries being made in, in uh, copper gold discoveries, which, are, which will be long-term things. They're large, but they're long-term, but they're, they're exciting and, and, and expenditures being made by those. One in the Star Mountains mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Highlands Anglo, and the other one west of Porgera, okay. which is uh, by a Harmony Discovery. Mm. All right. Now there's also a gradual upward movement in the price of oil. Would you say the bottom's over? I think it's, as I say, it's, it's, it's well out of the doldrums when it round just got below $30, but it's now 50 and it seems to have stabilised quite solidly around mm -hmm. the high 40s, 50 mark, which is is uh, a lot more encouraging for us uh, and uh, as I say I, th I think we'll see it maybe gradually rise but it'll take a number of years. The LNG side there's still a very much an international glut and, and that's not seen as being cleared till into the next decade. Mm. Mm. All right. Now just on the chamber itself uh, what will be your main activities this year? Oh we've got our, u our usual activity but our principal role of course is representing advocacy on behalf of the, the, the mining petroleum uh, players and, and, and the, the support industry. Mm. But we have many, many other ancillary activities in, our, uh, in education and, and conferences, of course, mm. and um, social, act social type uh, projects. But our biggest one being the investment conference in Sydney at the end of this year. And we're we're looking. We're really gearing up to that, and, and we're looking forward. Even though it's a difficult year for all of us, mm. we're looking forward for towards a solid attendance and that. And things are going quite well up till now. So, with the upcoming uh, conference, what is the theme for this year, and why has that theme uh, been uh, chosen? Oh, we're looking at growth opportunities. A focus mm. on growth opportunities because we feel that whilst it is. Uh, it is a difficult time for us all. There's some wonderful opportunities for PNG in the resource sector going forward, and uh, both in the LNG side and the mineral side. And those need to be showcased, and we need to uh, to uh, bring those out into the world and, and the, let the investors and all parties know what the, uh, how they how they're progressing and where they're up to. In terms of the speakers at this conference, who do you expect uh, to be present at, at the upcoming conference? We, we've always regarded the conference very much as a partnership mm -hmm. with government and, a, and, a, and our communities and so on. So we will have a, um, senior ministers, mm -hmm. relevant senior ministers, and we've invited the Prime Minister to open it, as usual, which always gives it the prestige and the status, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the, the Treasurer to comment on the budget. We're still looking for an international speaker to mm -hmm. go in that opening session, but we've got our eyes on a few and we... we, we uh, hope that will set the scene in that, that first session. But the rest, the, the other majority of it will, will showcase all the, the developments, the existing mm -hmm. developments and the, de the developments we hope to be, the potential developments. And uh, we do, we, we do, we've got two uh, extra sessions, one on environment and one showcasing social developments, which we always like to bring to the fore. The, the third day will be the seminars, the finance seminar and the uh, mining, exploration, mining petroleum exploration seminars in the afternoon. So we're still trying to uh, um, show what's happening with our exploration and our juniors that are, that are with us still. In terms of the whole scheme of things within the industry, what is the significance of this conference? I know it's the only place where most of the players in, in PNG get together for a few days, huh? Well, I think we've been doing it now for well over 20 years. It was originally an annual event in, in Australia, and it's now every two years, and we do the domestic conference, mm. which is a, we believe is a very successful mm. combination. Because you have to take, we have to take our industry to the world. We have mm. to showcase ourselves. We have to inform ourselves. The financiers, the drive, finally drive the, the, the projects, 
are international and we have to keep them informed and we have to keep them inside. And it's been very, very successfully, uh, successful, I believe, in doing that. It's now uh, a well-recognised international event. It, it's the prestigious, very prestigious. It's uh, devoted in, entirely to our business and it's well known around the world now. Mm. Now for those companies or individuals that might want to reserve a space in the upcoming conference, how can they get in touch with the chamber? Oh, well, we, you can get it through the chamber, link through the chamber's uh, website. We have a dedicated, also a dedicated, which takes you to the dedicated website. We have a Facebook page now, so you can reach. But you, anybody's welcome to contact us, uh, ring us up, email us, of course, and, and we'll send the necessary stuff. The program is being, the preliminary program is being printed right now, so we'll have that available within a matter of days. So. Uh, we're, we're getting there, and we've already got people registering. We've got well over 100 already, so. I hear there's not much space left. No, uh, the trade fair's going, which is, which is a good sign in these difficult times. We've got 54 odd booths mm -hmm. uh, over two floors, and we've got five left. So that's an encouraging sign. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, Mr. Anderson, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. You're watching Resource PNG. We'll be back with more after these messages. Welcome back. Time now to take a look at what's been making headlines in Resource News. A new comprehensive policy and legislation on energy will be introduced when Parliament resumes. According to Petroleum and Energy Minister Ben Micah, this is aimed at guiding the government's strategy to bring electricity and power to the majority of the population now without access to this important service. Speaking at the Pacific Energy Conference in Singapore recently, Minister Micah said this legislation is crucial, especially at a time when Papua New Guinea is focused on becoming a big player in the export of energy. This policy and legislation also aims to deregulate the power sector to enable the private sector participating in the provision of power and electricity. Uh, we are raising this issue, and I want to comment in this year for <coughs> taking the lead in renewable energy. In the conference that was Clean Energy Conference in Bali in February, uh, which I attended, and uh, you know, people came from the Middle East, from the US, all over the world to make presentations on clean energy. And uh, I believe Indonesia put forward some very, very interesting proposals, and they showed us some, uh, you know, prototype that they are now working on in terms of solar, wind, uh, in remote uh, communities. And in Papua New Guinea, we are like them. We are like the Philippines. Many, many islands, many remote communities, and the challenge for, for providing energy uh, to those kind of um, uh, communities uh, is, is very, very challenging. And those are just some of my personal comments I'd like to make, uh, which is very important for politicians and policy advisors to make all of us we are discussing. A team of geologists from Mineral Resource Authority were recently in Kokoda, or a province, to conduct an update on geological data within the area. Could require more work, we might spend two days in, in this area. This Data collected from this survey will be made available to stakeholders, especially potential mining investors, landowners and the provincial government for their respective purposes. According to Kokoda LLG President Jackson Iroro, the MRA's work was a positive development for Kokoda and the province. From the President's office, on behalf of uh, the ward members, the resource owners, I give my blessing for you to carry out this program. We only have oil pump company here. If there is positive uh, answers from this program, maybe a mining company may come in to develop the minerals here. Most important thing is uh, each province must generate 
revenues. Water province need to improve the cash flow. According to electoral boundaries, the Mare villages are located in the Huon Gulf district, but culturally, they share the same practices as their relatives who live along the Makam Valley. Mare looks like any other lowland village, but there's a key element missing. There are no buai palms. Like many other lowland Papua New Guinean villages, the buai is important for their cultural exchanges and social status. For the Mare, their buai palms were destroyed by a disease several years ago. <laughs> But the decimation of the buai crop may have been a blessing in disguise. In the quest to find an alternative cash crop, more people began planting cocoa. They found that cocoa income was far better than the money they made from the buai. Years ago, when the buai disease struck, it also affected their household incomes. Over the last 50 years, buai had become an important source of revenue for the communities at Mari. Perhaps isolated by the distance, many coastal villages separated by the sea have remained unaffected by the buai disease. Every day, bags of buai are brought by boats. In Lay City, there's no buai ban. But the buai sellers can't sell at the main market, so the buai bags end up here at the Kamkumung market. Here is where the Makams now get their buai from, and it's expensive. We pray to buy buai from Morobe, 200 kinaron para bag or 300 kinaron para bag. Lo you yet you spend how much money straight looks in buai? It's like 50 kina or 100 kina, I'm say you see on this la buai. I'm lo one plus week. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Resource PNG. If you'd like to get in touch with us, email us on the address now showing on your screen. For all the latest updates on developments within the resource sector in the country, check out our Facebook page. To view this program online, log on to the MTV website where you will find a link to the Resource PNG page. Until the next time, pleasant viewing. Bye for now.